Hello and welcome back. I hope you're all doing fantastically. It really is lovely to have you with us again for this, the latest episode of Extraordinary People, the Pride of Britain. The podcast brought to you from all of us on the Pride of Britain team and our friends at TSB. Now, I have to say one of the most brilliant things about working on the Pride of Britain is meeting our amazing winners, including people who've gone above and beyond to help others. Often that means stepping up when nobody else does, showing real courage and real determination. And when we meet people who have done these incredible things, we always wonder how we would react in that situation. What makes somebody run towards the danger? And here's a question, how would you respond? What makes one person brave? Are some people just more courageous than others? Or can we all learn to be tough? Well, in this episode, we've called it Lifesavers for obvious reasons. We're going to try and answer some of the questions and our guests know a thing or two about being brave. Well, firstly, I'm going to be chatting with adventurer and he's world famous now, Bear Grylls. No stranger, as we know, to extreme situations. And also to a top military psychologist, Professor Neil Greenberg, to discuss the role training and instinct play in survival and facing our fears. It's a fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Bear, it's wonderful to see you today. I think it was 2011 the first time you came to the Pride of Britain Awards when you presented Gina Moffat with the Prince's Trust Young Achievement. She was a remarkable woman, wasn't she? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you've done so many of them, obviously, from the beginning. But every <laughs> any years I've been involved, always a privilege, you know, and it's a chance, as you, as you know, to celebrate so many heroes. And the country, I think, as we're aware, is full of incredible unsung heroes who quietly get on and do remarkable things. And I think such a big part of it is is also the unsung stuff. You know, it's not all the yeah. heroics, of which there are some amazing stories of running into burning buildings and all of that. But so many of it is a it's a quiet things of service and and people just quietly battling incredible odds and and doing it with a smile on their face and not complaining and and being such sort of shining lights and inspirations. And Pride of Britain is full of those people. So it's a I think it's a reminder also of who the real heroes are in life. You know, I think it's all too easy sometimes to, you know, we 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 maybe get that that scale a little wrong, you know, and, and Pride of Britain is a reminder of the true heroes. I think it is. And uh, last year, 2021, um, he was over the moon, by the way. You presented our Spirit of Adventure Award to Max Woozy. And we talk about adventure imagining and we'll, come on to the things that you've done, you know, traveling the world and climbing the highest mountains and 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 swimming down to the depths of the deepest oceans. But Max Woozy didn't leave his back garden, did he? That was <laughs> and yet sleeping every night in a tent now for over two years. He's raised, yeah. I think, over seven hundred thousand pounds for the North Devon Hospital. It's, he is amazing. And actually he's sort of become a friend over the last couple of years. And and I love that, you know, and I, I mean, talk about a spirit of never giving up, you know, people thought he was going to stop at a, at 100 nights, and then 200 nights. And as you say, he's on something crazy now. But, you know, also, he's a reminder that, you know, heroism and, and adventure and resilience, it's, it's a state of mind, isn't it? And you, sometimes you don't need to climb the highest mountains, you know, we all have our own Everest, you know, and, and sometimes it's a hospital, and sometimes it's camping in your back garden for other people. I think Max's story was really lovely because he he just quietly wanted to help that hospice near him and uh, and got to befriend one of the guys there who's sadly no longer alive now, but who gave Max his first tent and uh, and said, go for it. And, you know, it's, it's legacy stuff, isn't it? You know, his, yeah. he, he has affected and, and bettered so many people's lives. And comes from a Royal Marine family and his family is so proud of him. And that night we had together at the Pride of Britain when, you know, his dad came on stage with us and, you know, he had tears in his eyes and just incredibly proud of 
of his son, and, and rightly so. Max rang the other day. He said, he said, I've gone through my fourth tent, I think he said. It's got ripped. <laughs> I mean, because he had that hurricane. You know, he, he endured that hurricane. We forget about that. You know, Matt, where was Max in his garden during the hurricane? But he said, Bear, have you got a spare tent? And I said, come with me. We went on FaceTime and went into the kit room, pulled out some tents and sent us some gear. But he's still going, you know, and um, what a hero. Yeah. It's remarkable. This is coming into the summer months now, I suppose. So he's, he's kind of enjoying it. And quite a few of us will probably join him in, in, in camping. But he was only 10 when he started. He's still only 12 years old now. I mean, I, Well, there's I, a lot to be can't... said, though, for camping outside. It is, you know, beyond the fact that he's being a hero and helping so many people, I do think it's very good for you. You know, I mean, you know, Baden Powell, who started the Scouts, reportedly never slept in a bed. You know, he... he he always slept outside on the balcony in his house. And I love that. You know, I do think it's, um, I think it's a healthy way, you know, as, as you guys know, the more time we spend outside, the better it is for our physical and mental health. So it's no surprise that Max has a big smile on his face most of the time. <laughs> and he's got his dog in with him in the tent. And, um, and awesome. <laughs> um, his mum said to him, you know, when lockdown first started, the first lockdown first started, and his mum, uh, Rebecca, said to him, when he had, came up with this idea, oh, I'm going to ask people to sponsor me to sleep in the tent in the garden. She went, nobody's going to give you a penny, Max, just for camping out in the back garden. And of course, you know, over £700,000 later. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful young man and a wonderful family. Um, on this episode of our podcast, we're, we're really taking the theme there about lifesavers what would you do? And I'm going to be talking to Steve Wharton, who I think you also met last year, who won the Emergency Services Award. But you were obviously went through military training, as we all know. We all know your story. Um, do you think that some people, Bear, are just born brave? It's an interesting question. I think, um, I think courage is in all of us. You know, all of us hope that in a crunch time that would be able to find that, you know, and sometimes it comes from nothing. But oftentimes it is, it's because it's honed, it's trained in people. And, and that fireman story is, is a good example of that. You know, I think if you're used to dealing with fear and adrenaline, you know, as you know, adrenaline can be overwhelming for people and shuts people down a lot of the time, you know, they, they, they freeze. But I think if we're used to that sense of adrenaline, then when it happens, we can, you know, step into, into action. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons I love Pride of Britain is that so often it happens to the most unlikely people. That, as you know, they find themselves in the situations and it then just bursts forward. And, and it's that people debate the line of bravery and stupidity and, or recklessness, you know. And, but it doesn't really matter, you know, what matters is that they've done it. And, and it's about service, ultimately, isn't it? And sacrifice and, and, and love. And that's why I love it. Now, it's interesting that you say about training that, that muscle of courage um, because, you know, you have many years in the armed, uh, armed forces. And um, do you find that when people come on your shows that they are different when they leave to when they arrive? Yeah, I think challenge and obstacles and storms do that to us. They change us all. You know, it's that thing of storms make us stronger. You know, we all go through storms in our life and they're not always easy, but uh, we come out of them always a little little change and hopefully a little strengthened. You know, and I think for me, the magic of Running Wild, you know, the, you know that show and, and being able to take so many of these incredible kind of global icons on, on adventures is that <laughs> I know that they're not there for the fame or the money. They don't need either of those things. They're there because they want that experience. They want something that money can't buy you know it's the the wild gives you that but it challenges you you know you've got to you've got to face those fears you've got to do the difficult you've got to keep going when you're tired and hungry and thirsty and, and frightened and uh and that's not always easy you know and, and i like running wild because you do it side by side you know together and and i see so many of these incredible people face those fears and, and have to dig deep in a few moments and it's not just it's not just a half hour long thing you know you're out there for a couple of days and you're sleeping in a cave and you're crossing the rivers and dealing with snakes and big heights and everyone's scared of difference but uh what i love is seeing people face those fears and 
often they kind of go into themselves a little bit. It's like you're, you're getting focused. But then what I've noticed with these stars is they're often top of their game for a reason. It's, and it's not because they've ever done anything like the wild before, but they're used to facing difficult things. They're used to pushing themselves. They're used to being yeah. out of their comfort zone and facing the, the awkward and the nerve, dealing with nerves. And that is a muscle. And I think that willingness to be vulnerable and put yourself in those places, you can get better at that. And, and when I see people go through it and then at the end of the journey, when we eventually get picked up, you see a, a light in their eye and a pride and a confidence. And at this point, I want to introduce you and introduce everyone to uh, Professor Neil Greenberg, who is a consultant, occupational and forensic psychiatrist. Hello, Neil. Um, Neil, you served in the Royal Marines for more than 23 years and you've been deployed uh, to a number of hostile environments, including Afghanistan and uh, and Iraq as well. Um, I just want to talk a little about what Bear was saying about the individual. And I want to ask you the same question. Do you think that certain people are born brave? So I think if you, if you look at um, people's backgrounds, I mean, you don't get born aged, you know, two months and turn into a, a brave human being at that point. But but we're forged, aren't we, by the environment in which we're brought up in. So if you're in a family where risk taking and adventure um, it, are part of what you do day to day, then you get used to doing that. So the first time that you're at school and you go out with your colleagues who stay at home and watch television and you're asked to go and do a simple task like, you know, walk up a, a steep hill or, or camp out overnight, to you, it's just what you do. It's what the family's always done, whereas everyone else in your class is completely petrified. So there's something about that environment which creates people who are both used to taking risks and actually really good at assessing risks as well. Oh, because bravery partly is about what's the threat to me and to people around me compared to what resources and skills do I have to cope with that risk? So if you, you, you spoke earlier on about firefighters, you know, a firefighter with the right safety equipment, with the right team, can go into a burning building knowing that actually that's frightening for others, but it's their day-to-day -day job. On the other hand, someone who's walking by going into that same building, perhaps not with the same equipment, is going to find that a lot more challenging. So I, I do think that, that what you can do is to be brought up in an environment that sets you up to be potentially more brave or more courageous than other people. Um, but just as Bear said, there may be another environment, such as, say, public speaking or, or, or going to ask a partner whether they want to go on a date, which can be, you know, completely and utterly petrifying, <laughs> whereas yeah. being in a tent's OK. In terms of um, psych psychology and psychological terms, what do the terms or the words, the semantics, danger and bravery mean in psychology? Well, from a, from a mental health psychology point of view, um, the, the, the term brave is much debated because brave does so much depend on the context. Um, and so if you're going to do something and it turns out that actually you were successful, people might call you brave. But as Bear said earlier on, if it turns out that something bad happens, you get called foolhardy or reckless. In terms of your career, and obviously I was saying earlier that you've been deployed uh, in the Middle East a number of times. Can you talk me through or talk us through some examples of um, bravery that you've witnessed? So the, the, the military is is full of lots of people who get put in, in difficult and challenging situations. And I have to say, as a psychiatrist, my uh, the sort of danger that I got put in was nowhere near as much as many, many more of my colleagues. But certainly having spoken to, uh, to, to many people who some of colleagues, some of who are patients, you, you get people who, who, for instance, get into a situation where they're, um, it's, say, in Afghanistan or Iraq, where they're going into a, a local's home. Um, to do something which is militarily right. So they're going to ask some questions, but all around them, they have people who could be the enemy. Uh, now, most of these people are not the enemy. Most of them are there. That they want to save them. They want to help them. But when that person pulls something out of a bag, is it a piece of fruit to give them as a gift? Or is it something which could be a, 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 a weapon that may be there to kill them or their colleagues? But they have to carry on acting in a professional and uh, a reasonable way with people who they are completely scared about. And what happens over time uh, when, you, when, when people are deployed is, is they, they get a sort of sixth sense. They try to have to work on the basis of the hairs on the back of their neck telling them what's going on. And, and that's really difficult because you can't train a sixth sense. You know, as much, as much as you do military training, 
so you you develop it over time and that comes from your experience and often the experience of people around us and, and one of the things about the military the marines i would say in particular but lots of the military is there is this band of brothers is that you would do for each other things that you would never do for other people and you have to believe that actually if you were in a horrible situation that actually you wouldn't be left there that people would come at at no matter what cost themselves to come and save you. And there are lots and lots of examples of that. Bear, um, just going back to your military life, what, was it, what do you think is the, the... You know, Neil was saying that it, it really, once you've assessed the risk in terms of the military training, you've assessed the risk, you know it's very dangerous, but you do it anyway. In those terms, what was one of the scariest things that, that you uh, did? Well, like with Neil, there's there's so many heroes that we know, the real heroes who, you know, have just gone through such incredible things, especially over the last, you know, 20 years, I think, yeah. with everything that's gone on in Iraq and Afghanistan. So many heroes, you know, that Neil works with, especially, and, and same with me through the Royal Marines charity, you know, people, have, soldiers that lost limbs. And, and in many ways, their real battles started after the incident, you know, and I think one of the the examples of bravery really is how so many soldiers are courageously facing, you know, the, the, the journey of PTSD afterwards and bravely and courageously rebuilding their lives and, and trying to make sense of things and trying to find new purpose and new communities and new camaraderie, you know, because as Neil knows, you know, there's an incredible power to, you know, when you first go, you, you go down, to, I don't know, if, don't know, Carol, if you've ever been down to Limpston, down to the Commando Training Centre there, but there's an incredible yeah. esprit de corps, you know, of, of a culture. If you're going through this together, you know, you're going through that training, you're, 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 you're bonding, you're forming friendships that last a lifetime. And I think for soldiers, especially after they come back from conflict or they've, they've been injured and then they're suddenly out of, out of that day-to-day community and culture, you know, that you could argue the, the the most courageous thing they'll ever do in their life is is to start to rebuild their life and refine community and refine purpose. And for me, it's just re- it's that same principle of recognizing the true heroes and so many incredible people that continue to go through this. And it's why I love doing things like this. It's why I love being involved in things like the Pride of Britain because it's it's about community. It's about celebrating those difficult journeys that people go through and often they're the, not the glamorous journeys you know we you know there's always a focus on those spectacular acts of courage but the like i say i think that the real courage is often is often just a day-to-day battle of of keeping going keeping positive being resilient bear can i ask you a, a, a more general point and and i'll ask you neil the same question um obviously we've just come out of fingers crossed uh two years of on and off lockdowns due to uh, the covid pandemic and even before that, you know, people started talking about mental health, but particularly so during lockdowns. Do you think that we do have a mental health pandemic now? Neil, you are, you are the true expert on this, but just the top line thoughts for me is that it, there's no doubt the last year has created an incredibly challenging environment for people mentally. You know, I think we are designed to be have community. We're designed to have challenges. We're designed to be outside. And you take those things away from people. It, it is inevitably going to create trauma of some sort in different levels in different people. But, you know, you can find people in a small area, you know, fighting to keep their jobs, fighting to bring up kids. You know, it's, there's no doubt it's it's been incredibly tough for people. And I think a sensitivity and an awareness for that as we emerge from this time and, and a focus on to sp- anything that can support people to rebuild that inner muscle, that muscle I was talking about, that resilience muscle, and to support people is, is a great, great thing. And that's why I salute, you know, Neil, you so much. You know, you, you spend your whole whole life day to day dedicated to helping people like that. And 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 bravo you, it's, it's amazing. And, and people need it more than ever. So I think over the last um, 20, 30 years, certainly since I've been practicing in sort of mental health, I think it's become more understandable and I have to say more acceptable to talk about mental health in the workplace. And to, there's this phrase that's often used, it's OK not to be OK. Um, yeah. And and 
20, 30 years ago, that might have been kind of said, but not really meant. Whereas now I think it's, it, it is definitely more recognised. I've been able to, um, through the Royal College of Psychiatrists and, and King's College London, where, where I work, to be engaged in a big study looking at healthcare workers. And of course, for the last couple of years, that's where our front line has been. Nothing against our troops and nothing against our emergency services, but the, the healthcare service has, has really pulled out all the stops and, and, and we should take our hats off to them for sure. And what we find there is there's many people there who have been put into roles where they weren't trained. Um, they did it because they had to, because that was their duty and they wanted to do it. But that's sometimes left a toll on them that that we now, I think, as society need to repay. Yeah. Um, and so there are certain groups of people and healthcare workers are, are one who, who have really borne the brunt of, of, of yeah. the pandemic. And, and they definitely are more at risk um, than they might have been before. But there's other groups out there and, and actually there's some great studies looking at key workers during the first uh, lockdown in, in 2020 and actually most of the key workers other than healthcare staff actually their mental health was better because they were out there they were helping the public they were delivering shopping they were you know uh, doing all the great things that, and and they were able to do it and, and of course people like to give back they, they like to do duty and servitude when they can so i think it's, it's a bit about winners and losers out there in some ways and I think what we need to make sure we do is to focus our efforts on, on, on those who have really um, done their all for the last couple of years. And, and I'm a great believer and, and the work I'm trying to do is to try and encourage um, seeing healthcare workers, not, not as a damaged, damaged bunch of people, but in a, in a way, just like we see military veterans as, as being deserving of special attention. Uh, because if we can't look after them, how can they look after us? Well, I think for me, the most telling thing, Neil, you said there is, is how those key workers during that time actually had better mental health. And, and as you know, it's, it's, it's clear, isn't it? When we're, when we're serving people, when we're volunteering, when we're helping, when we're out, when we have, have that kind of purpose and when we're valued and, uh, and we're busy and we're kind of using our physicality and, you know, we're, it's going to help our mental health. It's going to help our physical health. It's also going to help our mental health. And I think that is the key is understanding if you want to help, volunteer. You know, as a volunteer, there's so many studies of how it it helps us. It helps us having that purpose and that kind of clarity and that sense of doing something for other people beyond ourselves. And uh, and the studies always say, well, you volunteer, it makes it makes you happier. So I think, you know, and always listen. Always, it's always great to give to charity when we can. But I think the best thing we can do is volunteer our time and our skills. And it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, I look at how scouting works. Scouting thrives and is growing as you come out of this time more than ever before. We've experienced unprecedented growth over the last year. And that's amazing to see. It's because people, people want to be outside. They want to learn life skills. They want to be part of a community and they want to help their community. So I would say get involved, you know, get, get, be a volunteer. It doesn't have to be with scouting, but there are thousands, thousands sort of, you know, charities and organizations and youth organizations and, you know, elderly people things that need volunteers and thrive off volunteers. So uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of time. That's the key is a lot of people doing a little is the key to, uh, to these organizations. And I think volunteering is the key to a society that is a happier, you know, happier place. I would totally agree with that there. Um, Neil, if I can ask you probably the, my final question to you is, you know, if somebody at home, and I'm not talking particularly about healthcare workers, but anybody is at home and they're feeling low, what should they do? So what we would generally suggest is, is what we refer to as what's called stepped, a stepped care approach. So the best thing you can do when you notice yourself not being you, you, as happy or as, uh, as bright as you normally are is to take some steps early on so that might be um finding a piece of music that cheers you up a film that you like to watch reading a book um ideally if you feel able to go out going out and connecting with people who who, are, who bring positivity into your life if you can't go out you can do that remotely these days pretty easily so make connections and try and do something yourself to to bolster your your sort of well-being and actually volunteering or exercise or being outdoors, some sort of activity is, is often very useful. The, the sitting in all day and staring at the wall it, is generally not good for any of us. But if you've tried all that self-help and that really hasn't made much of a difference, then the next step is to reach out as well. There are mental health services that you can reach out to. 
And often they start off as light touch. You know, they're, they're not necessarily diving you into years of therapy, but those light touch bits may be enough, particularly if you take that brave step of reaching out and asking for help early on. What unfortunately happens, and the evidence is very strong here, is we tend to wait until the last possible moment. And, and it's not until the sort of the house has fallen down or the, you, you hit the buffers that yeah. people reach out for help. And, and then it's much more difficult to solve. So my key thing would be do all those things that, that, that have brought you pleasure before. Reach out to people um, who, who bring you positivity. And if none of that is working, then don't be afraid early on to reach out to professional services because the interventions needed there are often quite simple uh, and they may avoid you know, complicated interventions needing much later on. Thank you so much, Neil. Final question to you, Bear. What's next for you? Uh, yeah, well, I'm back on to Running Wild now, so we start filming the next season of that. So I'm on the road again, uh, travelling. Always always a privilege, you know, with, a, with our amazing crew of people, same crew we've had from the beginning, best buddies, the true unsung heroes, really, of, of the TV shows, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, yeah, time, a little bit of time away from the family now. But... Um, you know, I think we're we're so lucky, as as you've been saying. If you know, if we in this environment, we 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 have purpose and we have community and we have work, we're we're fortunate. I never take that for granted. Um, but yeah, cheering you guys on. You guys are doing such a good job, and and this sort of podcast hopefully helps people in some way. And I love those things Neil was saying of of the steps you can take. You know, certainly for me, exercise has definitely helped me so much. You know, during during the last few years, being able to just be outside. And, and even if I was exercising on Zoom with other people, uh, but just doing it in the garden, you know, that sort of thing is so good. And having community and, and, and talking to good friends and reconnecting with people. And such a reminder, isn't it, all of us, that we're, none of us are infallible. You know, we're all, all vulnerable to these things and taking little steps early. It's a bit like in the wild, they say, when you're cold, how do you deal with the cold? You act early when you start to feel the fingers a little bit cold. Don't wait until you're too cold and it's too late. Take little actions early to, you know, to help yourself. And I think that's the same with mental health. You know, it's, it's such an important part of staying all around healthy. So well done, you guys. And Neil, you're certainly a, a, a hero to many. Oh, well, thank you both. Thank you so much, Professor Neil Greenberg. We wish you all the very best with all of your work in the future. And of course, Bear Grylls, thank you. And uh, I'm sure Max Woozy will be listening to this and will be thrilled to hear you calling uh, him your friend now. So um, he- he'll probably put that up on, on his Instagram later, I would imagine, very much. Uh, but thank you very much and wishing you all the best with the next series of Running Wild. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care. Well, I'm sure that's got you thinking. It's certainly got me thinking too. Now, this episode is called Lifesavers, and somebody else who spends his life responding to danger is our Pride of Britain Emergency Services Award winner in 2021, Steve Wharton. Now, Steve hails from Cumbria, and he is a real hero. He's a part-time, a volunteer fireman who jumped into freezing water to rescue a 13-year-old boy who had already been underwater for many, many minutes. Everyone else had just assumed that the boy had died. Steve jumped in, he dived 20 feet down and pulled the unconscious teenager to the surface and to safety. You'll be glad to know. (laughs) It is remarkable to report that the young boy survived. So I asked Steve to tell us more about what happened that day and also about the night he won his Pride of Britain Award. So lovely Steve Wharton, I want to take you back, if I may, to February 2019 up in uh, Cumbria and, you know, a very, very cold day and just Tell me from your perspective what happened when you got the call. What happened? Well, it was it was shortly after five pm. Uh, I'd returned home from a day's work because maybe what a lot of people don't know is our fire station is an on-call fire station, so it's not manned permanently. So we actually got paged just after five o'clock. 
So you've been because you're like full time job really is as, as a painter and decorator. That's right. Yes. So yeah. that evening in question was actually our training night with the fire service. So I was just at home getting washed and changed, ready to go for that when uh, our pages went down and we basically go down to the fire station, tear off a, a little fax print and it tells us on there what we're actually going to. One, upon getting that, we thought, boy, stuck in water and it just sounded a little bit sort of different. We hadn't had anything like that before on that stretch. And we thought it was actually somebody that was stuck on the buttress of the bridge. It was like a concrete area underneath the bridge. Yeah. But as it turned out, it, it wasn't. And Casper, the, the boy in question, was actually on the riverbed. And how deep was the river at that, at that point in the it, year? It, it was about three metres deep, uh, roughly. And it's a bit of a featureless part of the river. It's just slow running and... Uh, at that point, there was a little bit of colour in the water, so you couldn't actually see Casper. Uh, two members of the public had been in previous to us being called, and they couldn't locate him at all. So, so you down. couldn't see him. So no. this, you know, wonderful thirteen-year-old boy, um, Casper, had, for reason, whatever reason, been trying to swim across the river. Had he? Yeah, it, it was an unseasonably warm February day. Uh, I think it was about 20 degrees, which for the north, it? north of England in February is actually just not right. So yeah. some of these young guys were down by the river, and of course the, the water temperature was still February temperatures, so it was really, really cold. And uh, I think that's what the sort of said the problem had been when Casper had been in the river. It suffered a bit of this cold water shock, and that put him in trouble, really. So there he was. There, two members of the public had tried to get him, but they couldn't see him. Yeah, and yeah. he was at the bottom, wasn't he? He was of he the was, river. Yeah, he was basically lying flat on the riverbed when we got to so him. So, what were you thinking when you went in? Because he'd been down there for how long by then? The the reckon somewhere between sort of fifteen and twenty minutes had actually been in the river, and you you maybe do think, is it a body retrieval as such? But you can never give up hope. We we formulated a little plan because on our station we're trained as what you call wading first responders, so we're only basically out to go up to our waistline. This was a little bit deeper. So the officer in charge that day and myself had a discussion. We had our dry suits on and we put yeah. in a piece of sort of literature that's called Ops Discretion. We're allowed to save a small amount of risk to save a savable life. And at that point, we, th we thought Casper probably was still savable. So that's when we said we'd implement Ops Discretion and we'd, we'd have a go at trying rescuing him. So the two of you went in? Yeah, me and uh, one of my crew colleagues, John Bell, we entered the river. And there was Helen from the home farm, which is the farm just across the river. She actually had seen the commotion go on when Casper had gone under the water. So she actually guided us to the last place she'd seen Casper. Yeah. And without Helen there... Yeah, it would have taken a lot longer to find him because once I swam above Casper, that's when I could see his silhouetted outline of his body on the on the riverbed. So just at that point, we had to think, what do we do? Because this was sort of out of our training remit at this point. So I just thought, I've got to take my life jacket off try and release as much air out of my dry suit as what I can and try and dive down to him. And thankfully, first attempt, uh, we got hold of him and dragged him back up. And what kind of state was he in then, Steve? Uh, not to sound callous or anything like that, but he was lifeless. 
And yeah. it was a case of aided by other colleagues on the riverbank. They had thrown some throw lines in. So we got Casper to the surface, got hold of the throw lines, and they dragged us back in as quickly as they could. And thankfully, at this point, there was paramedics on scene. The air ambulance had landed. There was a local doctor in attendance. So Casper got the best chance he possibly could from once he was brought from the river. I remember reading this story, Steve, you see, and it said, oh, for over 20 minutes. And I, and I said, we can't have been underwater for over 20 minutes. No, that means that you've drowned. So his mum must have assume, assumed that. Obviously, you know, his body was on the bottom of the river and here was his lifeless body. Could you see her when you retrieved Casper initially? Yeah, his mum and his dad were both yeah. actually there prior to us going in the water. And that's when you've got to sort of use your brain a little bit and think peer pressure. Mm-hmm. Can I save him without causing any harm to either myself or my other crew member? And yeah, it'll always stick with me because even though you could see him, you could I think you could hear them more just in absolute despair as you would be if that was your child there. So, yeah, the the noise will still stick with me of Violetta crying out because that was her son on the bottom of the river. And yeah. it just wasn't them there on the day. There was there was maybe between 30 and 40 people just on looking. So it created quite a, an audience at that point. So, yeah, we had to, we had to go about it professionally, but yeah. try our best as, as well. Just going back to when you were saying that you brought his lifeless, what appeared to be lifeless body to the surface, and at this point you assume that he has died and has drowned, which would be a natural thing to assume. Yeah. So that must have been traumatic in itself, really. It, it was. Uh, obviously, with our job, when our pages go off and we go to an incident, we have a certain amount of adrenaline running. And it's amazing what adrenaline does to people uh, from giving you a little bit more power to sort of get things done. But also, as well, it, it, it can keep you a bit more psychologically focused. And even though we... We did think that mm, they maybe does not got much chance there, but you can never give up hope. And like I say, all the professionals were there, the doctors, the air ambulance crew. So, yeah, it was. we just watched while they worked on him, basically. And, uh, and what did they do, Steve? What did they do? The, he's now on the river bank. What, what happened then? Yeah, once, once he was out, we saw the other crew members from the fire service put like a tarpaulin sheet. So obviously the onlookers couldn't really watch what was going on. Yeah. I remember the paramedics administering drugs to him. I don't know what the drugs were, but uh, obviously something in that state where that was maybe adrenaline and stuff like that as well. And then it was just sort of CPR and uh, ECG was rigged up to see if there's any output. And sort of from doing that to loading him on the air ambulance, it, it seemed to go quite quickly, and that was it. He was off in the air ambulance to Newcastle. And that was quite strange because we'd done our job at that point, but we're still engrossed in the job, if you know what I mean, because we want to know yeah. actually what's happening to him. And yeah. that's one thing we don't always find out. Once the casualties have gone, we're sometimes left a little bit wondering how are they. So when did the news come back? Because, you know, people listening will still think, well, how, how on earth, what happened next? So what did happen next to for you? What happened? That evening we have hot debriefs within the fire service. So all the crew got together with management and we discussed it thoroughly. And then we... We're lucky enough to get critical illness, uh, critical debrief, sorry, where trained 
fire service personnel will sit around and we'll discuss it basically like a counseling session. So I think it just, it's good because it paints a picture in everybody's mind if they haven't seen everything. Yeah. It's an incident. So we had one of them the next day and we just all sort of listening as it was on local radio, local TV, and there wasn't the right lot said, basically. We just knew Casper was in hospital. He hadn't died, and he was just receiving the best treatment that was out there. And so when the- you heard that he hadn't died, that must you must have been elated by that. We, we were, but also as well, in the back of our minds was what quality of life can you have from being in the river for that long? Like you said previous there, when somebody's been in the river that long, the chances are millions to one, yeah. basically. And uh, yeah. yeah, so we just, we wanted a recovery, but we wanted him to have a quality of life as well. And then I think it was about three weeks later, we got the news that, He'd opened his eyes. And wow. that was special. Yeah. That's that makes the job worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd opened his eyes and I think it was something to do with, if I remember rightly, a certain deodorant had been sprayed. And uh, whether it was his senses had smelt it and he did start waking up and within time he started talking. Slowly, but like I say, over time, it's remarkable where he's got to. Now it's it's a miracle, basically. I think it's fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Well, I hope I hope you celebrated when you heard that news, Steve. I, I don't know what we did actually. It was just <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just some fantastic news, and like I said, that's why we do the job. No, not every incident we go to has a successful outcome. And early doors, we thought this was going to be one of them incidents again. But it wasn't. It was uh, probably one of the better ones. It's up there. It's it's great news at the end of it, really. Steve, in this episode of, of the podcast, um, we took it to Bear Grylls and to wonderful professor Neil Greenberg, who is a military psychologist, about what makes one person brave and another perhaps not. What is it about somebody that makes them run towards the danger rather than for the rest of us running away from the danger? Uh, I was I was lucky enough when I was a child, one of my next-door neighbours was a crew member at Appleby, and it was always when you saw him run out to the fire station, there was that, oh, I wonder where he's going. I wonder what he's doing. And there's a, a group of kids who'd always wait and watch the fire engine go out. And yeah. back in them days, you could tune your radio into a certain frequency on the FM dial, and you could actually listen to the radio where they were going to. So it was watch him run out, watch the fire engine go by, then quickly go in the house and get mum and dad to put the radio on and find out where they were going to. <laughs> but... Uh, it's it's always been one of them jobs that certainly I've looked up to, and I think most of the crew members at Appleby is probably most of the crew members that are fire crew nationally. It's you're giving your community something, and you you're held in a bit of bit more esteem because you're going out and you're protecting them to the best of your ability, and you're trying to do a bit of good in your community. I think that's the best way of describing it. Now, I've been talking to uh, Bear and to uh, Neil about the subject of danger because, you know, as, as, a, as an animal, if you like, as a human, you kind of think, oh, God, I'm going to run away from it. It would be normal. It would be a normal thing to do. When you were young, do you think there's a special breed of people who go, oh, danger, I'm going to run towards it? Were you like that as a child? Definitely not. <laughs> Weren't you? No, definitely not. Uh, yeah, we 
we maybe rode our bikes down hills a little bit fast and jumped out of trees and made rope swings and things like that, which yeah. could prove to be dangerous. But I think on as a whole, it's you mentioned going to, towards danger. We train for it, and I think we we know the risks. You trained in that environment, especially us with the fire service. You do our hot fire training, and you're taught to see the signs of what's going to happen. So it's not just a case of going in all blasé and heroic. You sort of do the calculated risks and uh, you've got to wear the job up first and then see if it's worthwhile going in and having a go. So you, Mr. Modest, um, I know it's like, oh, no, I, you know, Oh, I don't deserve an award and <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> How do you cope? Because everybody now knows that you've won a Pride Britain Award because it was you were all over everywhere. Um, how do you cope with it when people come up to you and say, oh, aren't you, Steve, and you did this? At first it was really difficult. <laughs> because I bet, I bet, because you are so modest. It's like, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, was... Did you ever deny it was actually you? <laughs> oh no, that's somebody else you're thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> no, I never did that, but it was it was just so out of my pay grade, really, what was happening uh, on the way back. Well, straight after the uh, the event, the award ceremony, and the the little bit of TV on this morning, the, the morning previous, the phone never. Yeah. I could not keep up with Facebook or Instagram. It was just, it was bonkers. And coming back from London, the phone was going. It was the local paper who wanted interviews and the local TV wanted to turn up and do a bit. And <sighs> nice for a short while, but I don't think I could cope with it all the time. I'm just just normal Steve from Appleby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just an ordinary Steve, should I say. Well, I'm, I'm glad we were able to provide a, a, an interesting short chapter in your life anyway. <laughs> but did you enjoy the night? Did you enjoy Because it's more than one night, isn't it? Because it's a few days, really, when you're down with us. And we try to, we try to, you know, spoil you all as much as we possibly can. Did you enjoy it? It was absolutely fantastic because when I actually set off to London, I was told I was one of four finalists, so even then I wasn't sure if if it was in the bag. <laughs> so we travelled down to London and we were told to be at TV studios on the Friday morning, where I was told I was having a little interview, which was obviously a complete lie. When, <laughs> when, when Alison came running into the studio and had the reveal and then subsequently told me we've got 20 seconds and then you're on this morning sofa. And at that point, oh. that point I was, yeah, I didn't really know what to do because that's how my favourite <laughs> is at. <laughs> oh, well, we're so, we're so happy that you enjoyed it. We, we care deeply. You do know that, don't you? Oh, absolutely. We really, Casper's mum was overcome, really, when they came on the stage on the night of the awards. And, oh, know, absolutely. And met them again. Really, to say thank you it was for really saving us. Uh, nice for them to meet a lot of people as well, and such a successful yeah. outcome for them. And oh, look, gosh, lovely yeah. for them to be part of it as well. It was a nice touch. That. Yeah. And he looked so well, Casper, too, didn't he? Yeah, he's, Just... he's doing, doing great. Really, he's doing great. Yeah, so. Brilliant. Well, well done, you, and thanks so much for sparing us the time, Steve. I know you're a busy man. Thank you very much, Carol. Cheers. Thank you. Steve Wharton, you are a wonderful man. I'd like to say thank you to all of our guests, to Bear Grylls, to Steve Wharton and to Professor Neil Greenberg, to our friends at TSB and the lovely JK, and of course, you. We would all love to know what you think of this and all of our podcasts via any of our Pride of Britain social media channels. But for now, that's all for this episode. We will be back soon when we'll be talking to more extraordinary people, the pride of Britain.